What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review episode seven of season two of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. We are almost finished. We have just one more week, but we finally got to see where a lot of the production budget was spent, namely the Siege of Aragion. You got to roll your R's when you're talking about the show because all the actors certainly do, but the Battle of Aragion or the Siege of Aragion, that was this show's attempt at replicating some of the thrills that we got from uh, the Battle of Helm's Deep from the Two Towers, as well as the Battle of the Pelennor Fields and the Return of the King. And I have a quick question for everybody. We're now about 15 hours into this big, giant, sweeping saga, which is more than all three extended versions for uh, Jackson's Lord of the Rings combined. Do you feel like you've seen any great scenes in all those 15 hours that can stand toe-to-toe with the great scenes from Jackson's trilogy, in particular the battle scenes? Because my answer would be, of course not, but there is a silver lining. This episode, we were not subjected to the unique thrills of watching Theo, Nori, nor Poppy, but I'm sure they'll all be back for the season finale next week. And speaking of silver linings, YouTuber Charlie Hopkinson continues to deliver solid gold each and every week with his deep fake parody channel where Gandalf, Elrond, and Boromir Watch the Rings of Power, and last week Gandalf invented this drinking game where each time this show stages a scene designed to remind us of a better scene from Jackson's trilogy, you have to drink. And Elrond's reply immediately was, good God, man, are you trying to kill us? I mean, I about fell out of my chair. I was laughing so hard, but head over to Charlie Hopkinson's channel. He's getting close to a million subscribers, and he definitely deserves to be at a million plus. But just to keep these positive vibes going just a little bit longer, as a result of this show, I am reading a lot more J.R.R. Tolkien. And if you're a fan of his books, you might go years at, a, years at a stretch where you don't really return to his material. But because of this show, I've basically been devouring every scrap of information about the first age and the second age. And I picked up these uh, five hardbacks, The Fall of Numenor, Children of Hurin, Baron and Luthien, The Fall of Gondolin, and Unfinished Tales. And they basically are like, how, how can I describe this? If you've read The Silmarillion, there's certain storylines in there that went through many, many drafts by Tolkien over many, many decades. He This whole world was a work in progress for you know his entire life. And so with like the story of Baron and Luthien, like the early versions of it, they bear some resemblance to the final product, but like Baron's referred to as like an elf or a gnome and things like that, whereas in later versions, he's a human. But because of this show, I've just been having an absolute blast diving back into the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. And what I've come to realize is that his son Christopher Tolkien deserves a goddamn Medal of Honor because all of his father's unpublished works would basically be unavailable to us if it were not for his, you know, his editing skills and his ability to kind of put everything together and add in the margins, like the context, like in this letter written in 1936, he said this, and in this, you know, short story or poem that he wrote in 1942, he said this. And so you're able to see all the inherent contradictions and the revisions and how he like slowly but surely worked toward the final product. And speaking of which, one of my favorite new discoveries comes from uh, Unfinished Tales, the, uh, the hardbound editions right there, but he has an essay called The History of Galadriel and Celeborn. And of course, this show hasn't even bothered to include Celeborn yet. But in this essay, the very first sentence by uh, Christopher Tolkien is one where he acknowledges that the story of Galadriel and Celeborn has a lot of problems and a lot of inconsistencies, and right up to the moment where J.R.R. Tolkien died, he was still revising the official history of Galadriel, in particular her actions during the first age. But as I was reading this essay, I kept thinking to myself, like, all these little chapters or these little um, little vignettes about Galadriel's history, like, they could serve as cool flashbacks of some of her experiences from the first age in this show. But, like, even if there are inconsistencies between the different versions of Galadriel's story and, like, when, where, and how Celeborn and she got together and, you know, anyway, the reason I'm talking about all this stuff is that it's actually related to a lot of the material that we saw in this latest episode, in particular the Siege of Eregion, as well as uh, the relationship between Galadriel and Elrond. Because in this episode, for whatever reason, they share a really romantic kiss, but as everybody knows who's uh, read any of Tolkien, Elrond eventually marries a character named Celebrian in the books, who is the daughter of Galadriel and Celeborn, which puts the show in kind of a pickle because Celeborn hasn't even been introduced, but also it's like if and when Elrond finally marries Celebrian, is he going to be like, well, one of the back, back in the day before a big battle or during a big battle, I just decided to make out with your mom. I mean, it's just going to be a very awkward Thanksgiving dinner when all the elves get together and talk about their past experiences. But in that same essay, there's some really dark, savage stuff about the final, I guess, interactions between Sauron and Celebrimbor, which I found absolutely fascinating because that story is in the Cimmerillion 
but it's kind of told more or less like kind of broad strokes. But if you want some really gnarly, gnarly grisly details about what Sauron does to Celebrimbor as he's torturing him and trying to get like trying to get information out of him about where some of the rings might be located, and he basically uses Celebrimbor's body as like a banner or a flag and kind of like showing. I was like, Jesus Christ, Tolkien, like calm, calm down, like you're, you're really going to the dark side. I guarantee you this show's not going to include any of that, but I thought it was all worth mentioning. But if, like me, you have some frustrations with this show or oftentimes find yourself laughing at its expense, well then, go back to Tolkien's books. You can do no wrong. But let's get into some of the details of this episode. And I guess if you wanted to be charitable, you could say this was the best of the worst. Uh, maybe the most fun episode of all 15 that we've seen so far. I'm not saying it's a good episode. I'm not even saying it's a fair episode, but at least it is a better episode than a lot of what, than a lot of what has come before. And uh, there were very, very few kind of repurposed scenes or beats or moments that were pulled from Peter Jackson's films. On, like, There's one moment where these orcs are pushing the siege engine, or I guess they're changing the, uh, the trajectory of some of the uh, ballistas, catapults. Uh, I don't know, were they catapults or ballistas? In, in, any, event, in any event, whatever the um, siege engines were, you hear one orc say, put your backs into it. And it almost sounds like a line ripped straight from Return of the King. So going back to Gandalf's drinking game where you have to drink every time the show kind of grabs a beat from Jackson's films and repurposes it, you'd have a mild buzz at the end of this episode, but you wouldn't be wasted like you would with some of the previous episodes. But what I liked about this episode, and it's crazy to even say that, is that it finally started killing off some of these goddamn characters or and or putting them in a position where maybe they'll die. Like We, we don't quite know the final fate of uh, Aaron Deere yet. I mean, he got wrecked in that uh, that battle with Adar, and I was like, oh my God, like, are you going to make me start actually like liking Adar just a little bit because Adar doesn't come from the books, and so I just uh, I have no I have no interest in him. But poor Myrdanya, I feel like she's been a major character this season. She's had all this faith and love and affection for Anatar, and like you know that episode where he's like, she, she's basically getting wise to some of his uh, his craftiness, and he distracts her by saying like, oh, isn't your hair lovely and beautiful like Galadriel? Blah 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 blah. But she has so much faith and you know affection for him, and her faith is rewarded when he just straight up kills her and tries to make it look like <laughs> Caliburnport did it. I actually did laugh out loud. I know that makes me sound like a, uh, a sick, twisted fuck, but it was just so ridiculous seeing Anatar kind of do this little thing with his finger and seeing Celebrimbor knock her off the walls. But anyway, Mirodanya, we barely got to know you, but so long. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next life. But as this episode unfolds, it kind of cross cuts between three different storylines. You've got the, like the siege itself and all the battles and so on and so forth. You've got Celebrimbor racing to finish the Nine Rings for mortal men, all while uh, basically have Anatar almost with like a riding crop, kind of like whipping them and like lashing them and making them work. And then you have some of the drama going on in Khazad Doom. And I was struggling to get invested in the drama in Khazad Doom because when Khazad Doom, when they finally like shut the doors to the mines of Moria, it wasn't because of like an internal civil war or anything like that. Like the dwarves actually remained pretty fond of the rings right up until the bitter end. Like one of the most um, kind of moving passages from the Lord of the Rings is when one of the dwarves at the Council of Elrond asks, like, like what of the dwarven rings? Like where are they? And Gandalf says that basically, like, I think four of them were consumed by dragons, and that three were accounted for. But the last one that the dwarves possessed was taken in torment from the character of Thrain, uh, Thorin's father, down in the uh, the dungeons of Dol Guldur. But somehow he had managed to hang onto a map to Lonely Mountain and the, the secret entrance, which is what sparks the Hobbit and that sort of thing. But the way that passage was described, which is so bleak and so grim, but like the dwarves remain very, um, you know possessive of their rings but anyway so like the fact that they're trying to imply that there's some sort of dwarven civil war i just have a little trouble getting invested in it unless it's inspired by something written by tolkien but basically we see how durin king durin is starting to use an axe on his own men and he's determined to dig 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 get the wealth blah 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 and obviously next episode the balrog's gonna bust out which makes no sense because the balrog was not awakened until the year 1980 in the Third Age, but I've already talked about that at length. But yeah, that Balrog at the end of the First Age went into hiding, and he just snoozed right through the whole Second Age, but the show's not about to let him rest in peace. 
But because of this internal civil war, Durham would not be able to send reinforcements to Elrond as planned, which is one of the many reasons why elves and dwarves become estranged over the years. There's a great passage in the Fellowship of the Ring where you see Legolas and Gimli, like one says, well, I'd heard it wasn't the dwarves' fault that elves and dwarves are no longer friends. And Legolas is like, well, I heard it wasn't due to the elves that dwarves and elves are no longer friends. And Gandalf has to kind of chastise him, like, look, like, let, let sleeping dogs lie. I need both of your, I need, I need the help of both of you, et cetera, and so forth. But if this show wants to start trying to drive a wedge between elves and dwarves, that will at least be Tolkien-esque, even if they're going about it in a way that is a little strange. But getting back to Keller Brimbor, as he's working on the Nine Rings, he notices that uh, something's rotten in Denmark because his candles aren't melting and there's like a mouse that keeps kind of doing this repeat. It's almost like he, he recognizes that like he's in a simulation. He's in the Matrix, a Matrix devised by his, uh, by his pal Anatar. And so he tries to revolt. And there's a really weird moment where um, he basically like realizes that he hasn't been working with Mithra after all. He's actually been working with Sauron's blood. It's like... They could have come up with something better than that because obviously if you are you know, making something with like metals and alloys and that sort of thing and you think you're working with mithril ore, but in fact you're working with blood, like maybe they could have, I mean, this is just me speculating, but like maybe Sauron could have found a way to like crystallize his blood so that it actually feels like a material that the, uh, that the, uh, the forger would have to work with. But that just seemed like a pretty... Uh, lame excuse. Or maybe he could have said like, oh, well, I only gave you iron instead of mithril, which is why those rings aren't quite as strong as some of the others. Anyway, I, I didn't quite buy that. But I guess if you wanted to point to something that's kind of working in the show, seeing Celebrimbor slowly but surely trying to like you know, reclaim con control over his life and his craft and his city, that is some of the more compelling stuff. I won't say it's compelling, but it's more compelling than the rest of the show. But getting back to moments where you have to drink this show, try to steal a little beat from The Return of the King. One of my favorite beats from The Return of the King is when the riders of Rohan arrive at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields in order to lift the siege of uh, Minas Tirith. They had a um, kind of a similar beat when the, the elven cavalry arrives to uh, to charge all the orcs. However, the charge is um, it's called off at the last second when they see that Galadriel is in a cage. And of course, she's like, you should have charged. Anyway, she's always trying to... Be, be super tough. But Adar proposes an alliance in order to defeat Sauron. And it's a strange beat where Elrond basically asks, like, how many lives are you prepared to spend in this war? And they're constantly kind of doing these, like, whip pans or cutaways to that one orc who clearly doesn't want to be there. He's the one who proposed, like, you know, not going to war at all and just staying home and making babies and blah, blah, blah. He's the, he's the nice orc in the show, the friendly orc. But for whatever reason, throughout this episode, it just seemed like every time Adar's saying or doing something in order to try to win the battle, they'll kind of cut away to his reaction. You can see he's like, he's so like upset that Adar's actually trying to win, like that people actually are gonna die in a battle. Like at one point when they released that troll to try to finish off that wall, he's like, oh no, like he's gonna kill our own people, blah, blah, blah. And Adar, you just wanna say like, well then get the fuck out of the way. Like <laughs> let that troll do what he's gonna do. But I don't know if that orc is gonna end up killing Adar next episode. Let's get into theory. I very rarely get into theory, but they seem to, they, they keep trying to manufacture all these pregnant pauses where he's kind of losing faith in Adar. So I have a feeling it won't be Erendir who kills Adar uh, if, he, if he does in fact get killed next episode. It will be that orc and then he'll, you know, bow before Sauron. And anyway, I hope I'm wrong on all this because it'll all just be so stupid, but just given the history of the show, I think, I think that's the direction that they're going. And probably the most ridiculous moment all episode is when an orc says to Adar, like, you told us you loved us. I mean, I started screaming with laughter. Like, the depiction of orcs this season has been just insane. Like, orcs should eat man flesh, and they should chop up dead bodies, and they should destroy things. And that's about as far as you need to take their characters. And, like, they, they are born and bred and designed to kill, maim, and destroy. And everybody likes to point to this one passage. I think it was either at the end of the Two Towers. Yeah, it was at the end of the Two Towers, the book, where you overhear a few orcs having a conversation about the war. And everybody is kind of, like, I guess overanalyze that to bits, showing like, oh, like orcs I really are, like, you know, like you know, just like anybody else, blah, blah, blah. Not really. Like in the context of the story, they're the villains, they rampage, they destroy, they eat, they devour. But when he said, You told us you loved us, I mean, it's just one of many problems plaguing the show. 
but as far as the rest of the battle goes, it definitely has some recurring problems like digital horses kicking digital orcs. And I, I guess in theory, I kind of like the idea of the horses battling alongside their riders, but it just looks so ridiculous when the horses just suddenly, or like, you know, like a superhero, kicking orcs 20 feet away. And there's also still this problem where like people will slash at something that's clearly like 10 feet away and then like an arm or a leg will go flying. It's like really like get up in there. Like there's some moments where you can see Elrond actually was stabbing someone through the leg or whatever the case might be. But there's this weird thing where like they'll slash at something that's too far and it'll just explode in all this gore. I can't stand that shit. And they've been doing this since the, uh, the first season. But there was one beat that almost felt like a scene out of South Park where Elrond says to this one archer, like, you never know, like, don't lose hope, don't lose faith. You might fire the one arrow that's going to uh, turn the tide of battle. And I thought he was speaking kind of like broad general terms, just trying to um, you know, give her some inspiration. But then like three seconds later, he's like, all right, it's time for you to shoot that arrow. Like, come with me. I was like, oh, I thought you were just, and once again, I thought you were just trying to give her some encouragement. But as right as she's about to shoot that one arrow that's gonna turn the tide of battle, she gets hit by like 10 different arrows. I was like, oh my God, like this really is turning into South Park. But she pulls one of them out, fires at some gunpowder, and ends up blowing up a bunch of orcs and that sort of thing. But I'm sure that scene was intended to be incredibly inspiring, but it just came across as uh, a little clumsy. But is there anything else related to Celebrimbor and Anatar? Oh, there's that scene where Anatar claims that Morgoth used to torture him. I don't remember any evidence of that of any kind. I mean, Morgoth loved to torture people. I mean, there's like the Cimmerillion's full of scenes with Morgoth doing horrible, evil shit. And that's one of the main reasons to read the Cimmerillion is to see just what a great villain Morgoth was. But I can't remember any situation where Sauron was tortured by him. If anything, Sauron was always given special treatment. He was uh, Morgoth's chief lieutenant and given a, a lot of, uh, given a lot of latitude to do as he saw fit, but he eventually uh, chains up Celebrimbor. He's making him finish the nine, and Celebrimbor decides to chop off one of his thumbs to uh, to escape the handcuffs. I thought what might have been a more interesting scene, imagine if uh, Anatar basically said, like, well, you don't, you're not going to need both thumbs to finish this work, but if you don't finish the rings, I'm going to chop off your other, and then you'll never be able to create anything ever again. But anyway, Celebrimbor chops off his own thumb, but the nine rings are completed and they're put in a little pouch and given to Galadriel after this uh, ridiculous speech about how like light will make darkness go away. It's like, yeah, no shit. Light tends to make darkness go away. You light a match in a dark room and the darkness retreats, but it's, it's like this strange uh, habit of the show where they try to make like the simplest statements sound incredibly poetic and profound. And it's like, yeah, try harder. But at least Anatar, a.k.a. Sauron, finally got to do something in the battle. Celebrimbor gathers a few guards and tries to uh, take them on, and Anatar just, you know, waves his magic hands, and everybody kills themselves, and maybe we'll see Anatar getting his hands dirty in the battle. Uh, who can say? But I really hope this show will cook up something special for the uh, the final fate of Celebrimbor, because Tolkien very rarely really goes to the dark side, but the, uh, but the original description or the original fate of Celebrimbor, as I read in Unfinished Tales... It's very gnarly, and I hope this show will be willing to go there, or even if it totally disregards what Tolkien wrote, then at least it'll, hopefully they'll cook up, cook up something interesting on their own. Let's hope it's not something unintentionally humorous like that girl getting knocked off the wall by Anatar using Celebrimbor's arms against his will. But there's one interesting surprise this episode where Gil Gallat shows up, and I thought they were basically going to have him stand in that one place for the entire five seasons of this show, just you know, looking very somber and very serious and making his pronouncements. But he finally took off his robes, put on some armor, got into the battle. I don't know if he said this, but somebody said to the, uh, the trolls they were trying to take it down, go back to your hill and be buried. And this show, I think one of the biggest problems with the dialogue is that they, t they try to turn simple statements into metaphors or greeting cards or like overly flowery or overly florid comments. Sometimes you just say just like, like eat shit and die. Obviously, that wouldn't be very Tolkien-esque, but because the writers are constantly kind of tripping over their own feet, trying to capture that flowery dialogue, maybe they should try and keep the dialogue a little bit uh, a little bit more simple. Or at least go back to stealing lines from uh, Jackson's trilogy. At a, at a minimum, you wouldn't come up with lines like, go back to your hill and be buried. At any rate, the episode draws to a close with Adar taking Galadriel's ring from Elrond, and then we get some really weird, like, heavy metal orc music, or like, orc rap. I, I, I don't quite know how to describe it. It sounded absolutely AI-generated, but who knows? Maybe an actual composer cooked that up, but I was like, this is 
really weird. But yeah, the music for me in this show is a, um, a consistent problem. But then we got a little teaser of what's to come next week. There's a Balrog on the loose. We see uh, the Stranger and the Dark Wizard meeting, and we see that the Numenorean faithful are all declared traitors. I mean, I feel like if there's one major Achilles heel to this entire season, it's every single scene which took place in Numenor. And if you read this big old whopper of a fucker, The Fall of Numenor, there actually is really, really good stuff to be adapted, none of which is getting adapted by this show. But, oh, my God, I'm dreading the season two finale, or I guess I'm in a weird, perverse way, kind of looking forward to it. I guess I have some, some major questions for the Numenorians. Are they going to allow any more giant animals to show up and dictate their politics? And that all credit goes to Charlie Hopkinson for, uh, for pointing this out. But they let the sudden random arrival of a giant eagle like declare like who's going to be the next king, even though that, like, there's no like context or explanation as to why they would like, you know, perceive that to be such a deciding vote. And then they let the giant sea monster decide who should be queen when it kind of vomited back up Muriel. I I suspect there'll be at least one more giant animal that will declare that all the faithful need to get in their ships and sail to Middle Earth. But we'll get to that next week. But I have to admit, I am having fun doing reviews on this show every week. I'm really enjoying reading Tolkien's books. So I guess I owe a big, giant thank you to everybody involved in this show for getting me, getting me back into reading J.R.L. Tolkien's books. But let me know what you think down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.